Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with the best recordings of Sibelius's last symphony, number seven. Now, of course, number seven is the seventh of nine symphonies because Kullervo is a symphony, and the Lemminkainen Suite is actually a symphony. And Sibelius used to talk about the fact that he actually wrote nine symphonies, but only seven of them got numbers. In any case, the seventh is an epic-making work. It had tremendous influence on later music, particularly in the UK and the United States, largely because it's a symphony in a single movement. And it's a single movement that absolutely follows its own rules. It's not one of those, okay, yeah, it's a single movement, but it really has four movements, like a normal symphony that are all just attached to each other. Like Nielsen's Fourth, for example, that does, that, that also technically proceeds in a single unbroken movement. Schumann's Fourth does too, for that matter. But Sibelius's Seventh is Sibelius is seventh. Nothing else does what it does. In fact, it's so original in the way it operates that Sibelius was unsure what to call it at first. His initial title was something like Fantasia Symphonica, a symphonic fantasy or Fantasia, because he wasn't sure what it was. It simply evolved. And that's what a great performance does. It has to sound as though the music is spontaneously generating itself in performance. And the best performances all manages uh, all manage to do that. Excuse me. The best performances all manage to do that. One way or another, they figure it out. The piece lasts about 21, 22 minutes in most performances. It can be a little faster or it can be a little slower, but not a lot. I mean, there are some really horrible performances that stretch out to like 24, 25 minutes or something. I remember when Simon Rattle's recording came out, there was a particularly stupid gramophone review that talked about it as a bloated red giant or a red giant versus a white dwarf or some, something. It was Robert Layton, actually, who wrote it, the late Robert Layton. And I, I asked him about it. I said, what did you say that for? And, you know, he would always just say to say to me, oh, Mr. Hurwitz, there you go again, you know. It's like, yeah, but Robert, you're like a Sibelius expert. You, say, <laughs> you know, you're supposed, to, you're supposed to call these things out when they happen. But uh, that, didn't, that didn't get me very far. But the ironic thing, for example, about the Simon Rattle performance, which was that although the recording is deathly slow, I saw him conduct the piece live a couple of years later, and it was the fastest performance I ever heard. He got through it in something like 17 minutes, which was blisteringly fast and absolutely ridiculous. And I really, what happened, obviously, was that he learned the piece, first of all, um, subsequent to making the recording. And, and second of all, uh, the interpretation changed completely, which leads us to believe that that recording was not really representative of what his thoughts were about the work. And uh, I was very, very, uh, let's just say that that was not um, an experience between the recording and the live concert that endeared me to Maestro Rattle and his Sibelius interpretation. Actually, that Sibelius seventh um, concert was a weird, weird concert. They did, they did a Haydn symphony, Sibelius seven, Petrushka, and Lavals. I mean, talk about a a mishmash of of unrelated or or things that just didn't sit well next to each other. It was very, very strange. But let's talk about the piece. Aside from the fact that uh, it has one completely, totally original movements, the work was enormously influential in the United States and in the UK because afterwards, a whole slew of one movement symphonies popped up. And uh, it really, really uh, probably wouldn't have happened the way it did had it not been for the seventh of Sibelius. And we should just keep that in mind. Maybe I'll do a sequel piece on post-Sibelius seven, Sibelius seventh-like symphonies. Now, I have seven fabulous recordings of the seventh and a few 
Well, I mentioned one that was horrible. I'm going to mention one that isn't horrible, but it's a little strange. But I do want to talk a little bit more about what I think goes into making a really, really great performance. Now, one of the most remarkable things about this symphony is the fact that it's always in the process of becoming something else. A great, great swaths of it. And, and Sibelius does this through tempo, his control of tempo. There is no composer in history who had a more fascinating control of musical speed, who could give the impression of slowness and quickness and, and make the transitions as gradual or as quick as he wanted. It was a gift. It was a gift and it was a critical element of Sibelius's style. And no successful performances of Sibelius at any period can avoid confronting the fact that you have to learn how his music moves because nobody else goes the way his symphonies go. That's why he always had a problem with endings because he would set up a momentum and achieve a certain momentum and then the question became how to stop. And how to stop is, a, is, a, is an issue that even this symphony, this symphony has to a lesser degree perhaps, but certainly to an extent. And I'll show, show you something about it. It really is amazing. There is a passage after the initial theme, the initial theme, which is in the trombones, and we're going to play that in a minute, but first I just want you to hear, the, hear just one of the classic passage, passages of Sibelian evolution and motion control. You know, the music begins to speed up, and I have my little score here, and you know, just, I'm just telling you what what the indications are in the score. So you get a sense of what he asks the conductor to do and why it's so tricky for conductors to pull off successfully. So you've heard the main theme. It, the symphony begins with a gorgeous adagio on the strings, which are always divided. The violins, first and second violins, are in four parts throughout. The violas are in two parts throughout. It's a rich, beautiful, beautiful texture. Then you hear the main theme on the trombone, like a sunbeam bursting through the clouds. It's just gorgeous. And, and uh, immediately, Sibelius starts writing, poco a poco affretando il tempo all. That means start speeding up until, and then you go zipping along from Adagio several pages. And a couple pages later, you get to letter J, which is marked vivacissimo, really, really fast. So you've gone from really, really slow in a few pages to really, really, really fast. And the music takes off like a shot. And then after taking off like a shot, it goes whipping along for a bit. And it does that for, well, one, two, three, four pages until you get to this really scary string ostinato. It's do 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 It's like a heaving sea with the, the waves crashing on shore. And we get a rallentando, which is slowing down all. And then it goes on and on and on for a page back to the edition, original adagio. But here's the key. The key is that the strings, which are doing this ostinato, um, don't appear to slow down at all. The music on top of them appears to slow down. And Sibelius achieves this quite simply by writing the, the ostinato in, in half note values so that the string pattern stays more or less at the same tempo. How the conductor judges this makes a huge difference because then we have the return of the original theme in the trumpets in a minor key, very threatening, building up to this imposing climax. It's fabulous with both flutes turning, you know, exchanging their instruments for piccolos just for a couple of bars so that they can provide a little, a little gleam of brilliance in the gloom. It's really fabulous. So it builds up to this huge climax and that on the other side of that climax, let's see where we are. We're starting to go poco a poco meno lento, slowly and slowly less slow until on the other side of this thing, we wind up at, hang on a minute, ah, there we are, Allegro Molto Moderato. So that's a huge accelerando that's taking place over multiple pages. But again, you're not conscious of 
the fact that it's moving faster and faster and faster. You just have to be in the new tempo when you get there. And the music sounds as though it's just, it's just moving. It just keeps moving at the same, practically the same relentless pace. And then let's see, we go Allegro Molto Moderato. And finally, finally, then it starts to speed up a little bit. And we wind up at Allegro Moderato, which is the tempo of the middle section. Um, and so, and then, and then it's going to do the same thing again. It's going to speed up and slow down and then return to the original Adagio. It's just, it's just an amazing piece of music. That is such a tricky passage and I'm going to play it for you. I want to play for you in a particularly fine performance, which I am not going to reveal until the very end. That's a, if I have, the other reason I have my score. I'm not giving away the game here. It's, it's extraordinary how many conductors screw this up. You know, how boring they make this middle section sound, which should be one of the most thrilling climaxes in all of music. But it's all a question of how well the conductor controls the tempo and how inevitable it sounds. Because you're going, like I said, from Adagio to Vivacissimo, back down to Adagio, then to Allegro Moderato, and it's always a process. It's very seldom stable, and it can never sound like you're actually speeding up or slowing down. It has to just sound natural. Wow, quite a job, isn't it? So let's listen to that passage. It's a couple of minutes long, and starting at the, at the Vivacissimo the really, really fast bit, and you'll see exactly what I mean. You'll hear exactly what I mean. So here it is. remarkable passages in all of symphonic music and one of the most difficult to conduct. Now the other thing about the seventh which is so amazing and so much fun when you're listening to it when you get to know it is the kind of thematic transformations that Sibelius, Sibelius rings on his, on his material. I mean this is not a symphony that really has any what you might call sonata form although the central passage is kind of a development thing but he transforms his themes in such a marvelous way. The first theme that gets transformed is the main trombone theme, which you just heard actually in the last passage. But the way it originally appears was as after this huge, gorgeous adagio buildup. 
the trombones enter, and then it becomes the theme of this beautiful pastoral middle section, which, as I said, is actually the development of the whole symphony. But it's so it's so light and so breezy in this transformation. It's such a wonderful, wonderful thing. And I'm going to play you the trombone theme as it originally appears, and then its transformation into the pastoral music of the middle section. So here that goes. Now, that trombone theme is immediately followed by an answering phrase, ya -dum, ba -da -dum, and that goes on a little bit, and that gets transformed too. In fact, the entire, the entire paragraph gets turned into other things, but you can, you can break it up into its individual components to hear what Sibelius does with it. And that's how he treats it. He breaks it up and he does things with it. You hear, you hear the entire idea, that you hear pieces of it isolated in different ways in that central quasi-development section. So here is the, the second limb of the main idea and its later transformation in the central interlude. That's just a sample of what's going on in this magnificent 22 minutes of music, a pretty brief sample. There's a lot more that's very interesting. For example, you'll notice, you'll notice that, that when we get on the other side of the pastoral interlude, the music begins to recapitulate. The symphony begins with simply a rising scale in C major, and it ends with a return of the rising scale, except the scale is much faster and it repeats and repeats and slows down from the allegro moderato back to adagio. And when it gets back to adagio, it repeats itself backwards. It recapitulates backwards. It begins with the return of the trombone theme and then, and then finally winds down to the initial adagio, which with it, be, which with it began. There we go. Let me get the tongue twister out of the way. It really uh, is such a beautiful, beautiful work. Absolutely hypnotic. And I, I've, I've heard it performed many times in concert. And it always makes a, a really profound impression when it's done well. When it's done well. Sometimes it's done, as Simon Rattle did in that awful concert, as like a throwaway piece. It's like, like an overture. But it's not. It's a much deeper and, and more substantial piece than that. 
and it deserves to have a certain, to be framed in such a way that it's, I think, importance and, and musical depth and fascination um, is highlighted rather than suppressed by being surrounded by Petrushka and La Valse and the Haydn Symphony, which was another piece that was treated rather casually in this performance. Anyway, never mind. Let's talk about the recordings. I said there was one recording that was a little bit strange, and it's, it's really a lot of fun, actually, but it's very surprising because this does not come from a conductor who you would usually think is the most interventionist of conductors. He's known as a kind of straight ahead, straight ahead, sometimes fiddling with text, but not too exciting. It's Eugene Ormandy. Now, Eugene Ormandy recorded this piece twice. There's his first recording on Sony and his remake on RCA. The Sony recording is the one I'm talking about. Boy, does he mess with this symphony, especially after the, after that big imposing climax leading to the central section, the Allegro Molto Moderato. Boy, he takes the Molto very literally. And when the strings come in, I mean, they're just, he just rewrites the parts, basically. You know, Sibelius writes, ya da dum ba da dum ba dum ba da dum Well, so, well, Ormandy's strings are going, wa da wum ba dum ba ba wum but uh, oh, it's really wild, absolutely wild. And he completely rescores the end of the symphony. See, the end of the symphony is problematic because it's one of Sibelius's mezzo things. You know, you don't know how fulfilling it should be. It's, in, it's one of his classic amen cadences. You know, Sibelius always liked to end things with a sort of hymn-like amen sort of thing. And, and here it is. It's really kind of cool. That's it. And as you can see from this ending here, see that? You know, some of the strings are moving from forte to fortissimo, and, the, and some of the woodwinds too, but the brass and the timpani are going from fortissimo down to mezzo forte. He wants to create this sort of, that, that, that satisfying, beautifully mellow, hymn-like sonority organ-like almost at the very end. And and also, how long do you hold on to that last chord? There's no fermata. It's actually a fairly abrupt ending. It's da da. It stops a little bit sooner than you think it may, maybe that it should stop. And so a lot of conductors hang on to it a little bit longer, and I don't blame them for doing it. Ormandy rescores the whole thing. He adds trumpets to the end, and everybody's making a big crescendo, and it just, it's, I don't think it's what Sibelius intended at all, quite frankly. But it's an interesting performance to hear, because Ormandy was a marvelous Sibelian, and, uh, you know, but he, he could be quite interventionist when he wanted to be. It's something to keep in mind for all those people who think that he was just from a tempo-wise not very exciting and not very, not very interesting and not very interventionist because boy, does he intervene. But that aside and the horrible Simon Rattle out there somewhere, there's some other horrible slow ones and you know we don't need to go into those. I wanna talk about the wonderful ones now. The first, and most wonderful. No, it's not the most wonderful, but it's quite wonderful. And we've talked about these. These are names you're all going to be familiar with because we've discussed them in other videos about the symphonies. You know, one of the things about Sibelius is that you very seldom find performances by conductors who um, don't understand the music well and get into it and do it well. If they've done cycles, if they've paid a lot of attention to Sibelius in their careers. He's one of those composers who has his advocates, and they tend to understand how he, how he operates. There are some people, for example, Barbaroli, who did a great Sibelius too, and then was sort of iffy in, in everything else, um, because he sort of applied the Sibelius to formula to everything else. But by and large, by and large, there are wonderful conductors who, who get most of the symphonies. And do, and do them justice. So I, I'm sorry if I'm not coming up with all kinds of incredibly obscure and interesting performances of the seventh. They don't happen. You find them in the big cycles for the most part. 
and and most conductors who do the seventh because it's only 22 minutes long have to do more Sibelius with it. I mean, you're not going to couple it with Petrushka and Lavals unless there's something wrong with you, and so and so they get they get it. They get the music, and so we're going to have some familiar names. The first is Herbert von Karajan, whose Sibelius Seventh is is very, very beautiful. And let me see, let's see how long it is, just out of curiosity. Uh, 23 minutes in a bit. You'll see that most of these all come in around the same time, 22, 23 minutes or so. And this is with the Berlin Philip. He was in his prime. It's coupled with a sensational Sixth Symphony in this case. And it's in the Sibelius box that we talked about. Um, with all of his DG Sibelius recordings, and it's definitely one of the great ones. So there's that. And then we have to include Pavel Berglund. This is from his Bournemouth cycle, his first Sibelius cycle. I mean, he did three complete Sibelius cycles and quite a few miscellaneous performances on various labels. So, you know, pick your Berglund. Berglund was one of those conductors who was extremely good at, at revealing these slowly unfolding organic formal designs. That was kind of a specialty of his. He was not a big moment whack the climax conductor. He was a let's integrate everything and make a seamless unity out of it. And boy, does that work in the Seventh Symphony. Now, I enjoy this first performance. Some may enjoy his last performance with the Chamber Orchestra of Europe. I, they're all good. They're all very, very good. And let's just look at the timing here. 21 minutes and 55 seconds. You see how they're all they're all kind of coalescing around 22 minutes? That's basically how it's going to work. So so Berglund, Bournemouth is wonderful, but you can you can make sure them holding up. Yes, this is that. <laughs> Some of these these EMI boxes, they all look the same. And I grab them quickly, and I'm not quite sure sometimes what I've grabbed. But yes, this is the Berglund Sibelius Seventh. Also marvelous and definitely worth having is Lauren Mazel Vienna Philharmonic, one of the great Sibelius cycles that we've talked about on numerous occasions. And let's look at the timing here. You know, timings are so so deceptive because what matters often is the the internal series of contrasts between sections rather than the overall timing. But since this is one one movement long, um, and you can mess up those internal cl uh, contrasts, as I as I indicated. Um, it's just interesting in this case, I think, to look at the timings and see where we're coming in. So here we're 21 minutes and 18 seconds for Mazel in Vienna. This has always been regarded as one of the great sevenths, and, and rightly so. It has all of that sense of inevitability, and you've got the inimitable Vienna Philharmonic on top of it all. What could be bad? Then there's, ah, yes, Bernstein. Now, this is a little bit controversial because Bernstein is always controversial in music that is not flashy and that, you know, doesn't have huge, sweaty, you know, overbearing emotional climaxes for him to hit. But Bernstein, we have to remember, you know, sort of took as the, the model for his Sibelius, at least initially, his mentor, Serge Kusevitsky, who was one of the great Sibelians. And, you know, you can find his old mono. I, I'm not talking about it because the sound is so limited in his Sibelius recordings for the most part. But they're very good. I mean, mostly very good. And Bernstein is not a Kusevitsky clone. I mean, not by any stretch of the imagination. He was actually a much better conductor than Kusevitsky. But let's see if I can find, we can find out how long this one goes. Ah, there we are. 22 minutes and 49 seconds. So you can see that despite Bernstein's reputation for wretched excess, he's not being wretched or excessive. He's actually well within the parameters of what constitutes good Sibelius seventh recording, if you want to call it that. And it, this is far superior to his Vienna Phil remake on Deutsche Grammophon, where he has slowed down considerably and gotten heavier and I think just tremendously less effective. I mean, that's one of those cases where doing it live and, and you know, patching it together it just didn't work. It sounds like it was patched together and it doesn't have anything like the in inevitability and thrust of this earlier version. But that's Lenny. And then we have, oh, yes. Let's check this one out. Blomstedt. Blomstedt is another conductor like Berglund, 
who is an extraordinary um, organic guy, a cohesion guy, a conductor who knits things together seamlessly. And his whole Sibelius cycle is like that. This is one of the great, 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 great Sibelius cycles. It really is superb. And let's see. Oh, uh, let's see how long it is. Here it is. Oh, there you go. 22 minutes and 27 seconds. So essentially the identical tempo is Bernstein. And there you go. I mean, you're, 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 the, way, the way it just shakes out. Sometimes, like I said, timings matter. And here's a case where they may. So there's Blomstedt. And before we get, oh, I have one more, two more here. Let's see which one this is. Okay, yeah, oh, this is wonderful. This one is fabulous too. Segerstam with the Helsinki Philharmonic on Ondine, another one of the great, great, great Sibelius cycles. And I say those three greats with total purpose and intention because they really are superb. I mean, you've got Sibelius's hometown team. Boy, do they know the music. Segerstam knows the music. And in this cycle, there are times when he can be very, shall we say, loving because he's, he pays great attention to string playing, string articulation, critical in Sibelius, absolutely critical. All of those chugga 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 ostinatos and tremolos and things, they all have to sound alive. You can't ever play them with indifference or routine, and they don't here. And this performance is 21 minutes and four seconds. So it's a little bit on the quick side of the 22 minute line, which is interesting because that is not the way that a lot of the performances in this cycle go. So you can hear how, how Segerstam has really responded to the, the idea of this symphony as a single continuous span. It may be interesting that Segerstam, who's written something like 430 of his own symphonies, um, mostly in one movement, uh, may have been quite influenced by, by the example of Sibelius as well. However, <clears throat> there is one modern recording, this is a new one, that I think is really, really exceptional and surprising. And it's a bit of a sleeper and it may not come from the usual source, but it is the source of the examples that I played you. And I hope you were able to note um, the remarkable, the remarkable sensible control of tempo and the textural transparency that this performance, um, this performance displays. It's just a marvelous, marvelous interpretation, wonderfully played and completely convincing. And it is, here it is, you ready? Petri Sakari with the Iceland Symphony on Naxos. This is not a 100%, I think, recommendable cycle. Sakari, Sakari is one of those conductors like so many these days, especially the Finnish conductors who are extremely good at the later symphonies, not as good at the big, romantic, juicy, Tchaikovsky and earlier symphonies. But if you, but for the later symphonies, this guy is fantastic. And he has the Iceland Symphony playing marvelously. The Iceland Symphony is not a huge orchestra. It's almost like a, a large chamber orchestra. It's quite similar to the Lotti Symphony Orchestra, you know, with, with uh, Osmo Venska, which is also a fine performance. I mean, there are many other fine performances. There's Colin Davis in Boston and Colin Davis at the LSO later on, not Colin Davis at the LSO and RCA, the one on the LSO's own label. That one's good. The RCA one's terrible. But, uh, you know, there are, there are many other decent or very good, some fine performances of the seventh. But these for me are the special ones, the ones with, with that both realize the, the special nature of the work while also managing to characterize and make it something personal to the conductor. And this is one hell of a seventh. A fantastic performance, as good as any. And it comes with an absolutely splendid performance of number six. If you get the uh, disc separately, you get six, seven, and the Tempest Suite number two. You can get the disc separately. It's one of the one of the finest Sibelius discs of recent decades. It really is phenomenally good. So um, that's my current recommendation. Believe it or not, yes, all these famous names and famous Sibelians, but this guy just brings home the bacon in Sibelius's marvelous, marvelous Seventh Symphony. You know, just on reflection at the very end, you know, with all the talk of Sibelius's eighth and what he was going to do after the seventh, you kind of understand why after the seventh he gave up writing symphonies. Because this, this piece of music is, 
it's like, you know, Athena springing forth fully cloaked with, you know, <laughs> with helmet and clothing from Zeus's head. It's just, it's just this exordium that seemed to pop out of him. And what was he going to do next? I don't know. It's one of those pieces that seems such a definitive period that uh, there, there can be nothing that needs to be said afterwards. And so Sibelius stopped. To his credit, I believe, you know, the great mystery, he lived 30 more years and after the 1920s when this came out, it's like, why didn't he do more? Why didn't he do more? You know, Dvorak gave him some very interesting advice. Sibelius and Dvorak met once and they talked about composition and Dvorak said to Sibelius, he said, you know, I've written too much. And Sibelius, by the time he got to the Seventh Symphony, was past Opus 100. Much of it, stuff he wrote to make money, piano music, short pieces, things like that, salon music that nobody cares about today. And so he quit. And I think that's one of the most admirable things an artist can do. It's so difficult to know when to shut up. Everyone tells me I don't know when to shut up, so I'm going to shut up now. Keep on listening, folks. Thank you so much for joining me. Take care.